to Mom and Mind, where we dive into all aspects of perinatal mental health and wellness related to conception, pregnancy, birth, loss, postpartum, and new parenthood. We raise the volume on these topics in hopes that someday everyone will have the support and information that they deserve before they need it. Please note this podcast is not a replacement for treatment by a professional or professional training. Welcome back to Mom in Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. We are rounding out Maternal Mental Health Month with a conversation about black women in birthing and postpartum. We're talking with Professor Chinyere Opara and Dr. Saida Pepra, who are part of the Black Women Birthing Justice Collaborative. Today, we're discussing some of the research they have done and the report called Battling Over Birth. Highlights from our discussion include the power dynamics in the birthing environment for black women, history of sexual survivor issues and how that might impact the birthing experience, empowering black women in the birth space, and some glimpses into what the Battling Over Birth Report recommends for all of us to be doing. Please note that some of the content in this episode may be sensitive for some listeners discussing sexual trauma. Our guest today, Julia Chinere Opara, is a social justice educator, collaborative leader, activist scholar, and an experienced community organizer who spent over two decades producing critical scholarship in the service of progressive social movements. Opara is an African diaspora specialist. Her work is informed by personal experiences of crossing racial, gendered, and national boundaries as a transracial, transnational adoptee, survivor of intimate violence, and queer parent. Opara is provost and dean of the faculty and professor of ethnic studies at Mills College, educated at Cambridge University and Warwick University. She's the author of Other Kind of Dreams, Black Women's Organizations and the Politics of Organization, the only comprehensive history of the Black women's movement on Britain, and as well has edited several books. Her most recent book, Birthing Justice, Black Women, Pregnancy, and Childbirth, places Black women at the center of debates around childbirth and foregrounds their role in the emerging birth justice movement. Opara recently launched Battling Over Birth, a human rights report and social media campaign based on a five-year-long participatory action research project about Black women's experience of pregnancy and childbirth in California. Our guest, Dr. Saida Pepra, is a clinical psychologist and birth doula. She is currently an instructor and consultant with the Association for Holistic Maternal and Newborn Health, teaching cultural awareness, cross-cultural communication, and perinatal mood disorder content for the organization's trainings. Dr. Saida is also an active member of the Black Women Birthing Justice Collective, promoting research, education, and community-based services to positively transform birthing experiences in the Black community. Dr. Saida currently serves on the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, Maternal Suicide Review Committee, working with other health care providers, researchers, and maternal health professionals to identify key factors in preventing maternal suicide. I'm so honored to be having this conversation with them today, so let's welcome them. Welcome, Professor Opara and Dr. Saida. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Kat, for inviting us. I'm very excited to chat with you both. I've been able to be a little part of the work that you're doing in a conference that I attended, and I'm just blown away by the depth and passion that you both have for the work that you do. And We're just going to give people a little taste of that. I'm really hoping that after our conversation today, people can get connected to you and find out really more about what you're doing. So thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here. Sure, of course. Absolutely. So if you can first give us a little bit of context and tell us about Black Women Birthing Justice and also Battling Over Birth. Okay, great. I'll start. This is a Saida. So Battling Black Women Birth and Justice is a collective of African-American, Caribbean, multiracial women who've come together with this concept to transform the experience of Black women in their birth experience, to educate people on the things that we're talking about today, the challenges with maternal health, to be able to talk about negative experiences that Black women have had and other women of color with the medical field, with their pregnancies, and just to have a supportive space to discuss and also to then build on that and create more awareness in the community. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that we realized as we created the organization was that it is possible for Black women to have an empowered birth experience that's safe for them and then for their child, but too often that's taken away from us, and that through grassroots community organizing, we can really make a difference. And, you know, Black Women Birthing Justice really came out of our own lived experiences. It wasn't theoretical. I was one of the co-founders. And, you know, I 
had an experience myself of going through a pregnancy where I found myself getting increasingly labeled as at risk, being a black woman, but also being what they called AMA, advanced maternal age. Mm -hmm. And then also being a black woman, I also had fibroids, which a lot of us seem to. And then that was another sort of label. And I found myself, you know, what it felt like really being directed towards a C-section and towards having a birth that had nothing to do with what my vision was. And I was able to turn that around with the support of a really amazing midwife and doula team. But it felt like it was a close call. And my baby was actually posterior. And so, and I was in a hospital and, you know, after I was able to push her out, after many, many hours of pushing, you know, they went out and triumphantly wrote it on the nurse's bulletin board because they said nobody delivers the posterior baby vaginally here. You know, it was something that was like countercultural that that was something that you could actually do. But they were able to do that for me in that space and help me to just, you know, really be empowered. You know, and then I connected with another sister who's a younger woman and she's a youth activist. And she had had also a really coercive experience where she had been trying to have a home birth and the paramedics had come over and tried to call the police on her and threaten her and felt that she wasn't safe. And it was actually a family that called them in. So we began to realize that this is so complicated, you know, that even sometimes with the best motivations possible of wanting to help and keep ourselves and our family safe, we're doing things and we're taking actions that are really disempowering women. And so we came together and we sat down and said, what can we do if this is what happened to us as to really empowered activist women right. <laughs> in just of the age spectrum, you know, then, you know, what's going on for other black women? And we decided we wanted to find out and we wanted to make a difference. Wow. And so how long have you been doing the work with black women birthing justice specifically? So Black Women Birthing Justice started in 2011 with some fairly informal meetings in mostly my living room. And we still meet in mostly my living room. <laughs> so we've grown a little bit since then and done a lot of work. But also towards the end of 2011, we started this research project, which we called a research justice project. Mm. Because we believe that research, as it's been done traditionally, has taken the control and power away from the communities that are actually being researched and right. expert researchers who oftentimes don't know a great deal about what our lived experiences are and tend to see us as numbers and statistics rather than people. And so through a research justice lens, it's about actually the people who are being directly impacted by an experience, having the tools, becoming the researchers and doing the research and putting the information out there to make change in our communities. And so we started this research project, which then, you know, after five years, we were able to start writing it up after having connected with over 100 African-American women in California. And Saeed, I don't know if you want to talk about the experience of doing sharing circles, because we actually didn't do the traditional research methods, but we actually brought people together in really beautiful spaces to share their experiences. Yeah, I would love to hear about that. So one of the things that's you know unique in the model that was used for this research project was that the women came together pretty much in living room style in a way that people would feel like women would feel comfortable talking about the true experience that they had, like not feeling like they're being researched. So then they have to say the right thing and what kind of medical people are going to, you know, hear this information. It was like, you know, very much sister circle, tell us about your experience. And even though it was structured with specific questions that every woman in the circles had, It felt like, you know, and having done one in Los Angeles here, it felt like just a really sweet time for the moms who have given birth in the past five years to come together, have food, children in the living room, and to Mm -hmm. sit down and talk about the birth stories. And so then what came out of that was not only sort of getting the information, which was very helpful, but it was a very healing experience. Like to sit there, a lot of the women would say that this is the first time that they've ever shared this part of their their birth experience and that in and of itself even though the intention of it was you know to gather information to create a safe space where women could feel like they could talk about their experiences it also then became a healing circle which I thought was really powerful as a psychologist to like to see the impact of that in the circle. Wow that's amazing. Yeah I was just going to say that you know research in black communities has often been like a negative thing Mm -hmm. and it's medical research there's been a lot of suspicion just because of the history if you think all the way back to the Tuskegee syphilis experiment that only ended in the 70s when black activists outed this racist experiment you know that was being carried out and preventing black people from getting treated you know all the way up to just the research that you can have whole panels of researchers sitting down to discuss black maternal health care and there will not be a black person in the room 
So you know, this has been a negative experience. So for us to recreate and reclaim research as a positive experience that can be healing and empowering has been really a great journey for us. Wow, that's amazing. And I'm really hoping that, I just love that also you're able to share that your experience started in your living room. And I think that in and of itself is empowering for people to hear that that people don't have to wait for somebody else, that if you see something and you feel like you have the time, resources, passion, whatever, just start it in your living room and look at what you're doing now. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I would say just one thing. We don't have the time. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. If black women sit around waiting for us to have the time to do the work, it won't get done. You just have to do it anyway. You know, all of us have jobs. Most of us are parenting. You know, we have so many different commitments in the community and yet somehow the time just happens when you get together and there's that joy and that love and that care, sure. then you make the time to make the thing, the work happen. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Okay. So can you give us a little bit more information about the battling over birth? Yeah. So battling over birth is a human rights report that brings together these a hundred women's stories and really begins to unpack what were the common themes? What were the common threads? What were the experiences that women had that were really negative? But also, what were the experiences that were empowering that we want to see health providers and birth practitioners replicating and also community members? So the reason we called it Battling Over Birth was because of so many of the stories really talked about their birth experience as a battle. And we're focusing here on the birth experience of women who were birthing in the hospital. Mm. We also had a lot of women in the report who had home birth experiences with midwives and they didn't experience that as a battle. But that theme that kept coming up was that women who went into the hospital and expected to have their birth plan, which oftentimes they'd written down, be respected, or their, you know, their desires be listened to, most often found themselves in conflict with the very practitioners that were supposed to be helping and supporting them. And so we had women talking about really feeling coerced into having medical procedures that they weren't comfortable with or they didn't really understand. We had women talking about actually saying, no, I don't want that, and then feeling that they were being bullied and that they were really being mistreated if they tried to stand up for themselves and for their rights. And sometimes their family members also sort of being labeled as troublemakers if they were trying to say, no, she doesn't want that. And so there was this real sense of that instead of it being a team of, you know, nurses, OBGYN, you know, birthing person, and then the family or supporter working together in a common goal, it felt like the birthing person was trying to push out a baby and fight for her rights and to be heard at the same time. And so that's where we came up with the title of Battling Over Birth. Wow. Well, that seems a thousand percent appropriate and devastatingly sad as well just all that what you're describing is all of this power being taken away you know one of the things that was most moving in the sharing circles was when we actually had women who had had that kind of experience and then in the same sharing circle you had somebody who had had a really empowering beautiful birth experience perhaps in a birth center or in a home birth with a midwife and they would talk about how things flowed and everybody listened to them and everything went at the pace of their body and it was this spiritual space and sometimes maybe they had a toddler who would be there supporting, you know, like touching mommy and saying, you know, I love you. And it was just so powerful. And that's what would make women who had a negative experience cry because they almost didn't know what was possible and they felt that they had something had been stolen from them. But oftentimes before they heard that, they didn't even know what was possible. And in fact, it just become very normalized to have this kind of medically coercive birth. Wow. That's just devastating. And though you guys spoke to a um, hundred women. So, I mean, if you just expand that out to the, you know, to the rest of society, how many women is this happening to? It's horrifying to think of mm-hmm. on that scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So some of the things that would be important for us to discuss is some of the sexual survivor issues that you addressed in the report on all of this stuff happening in the news and media with the Me Too. Can you talk about that and how it relates to all of this? Yeah. So what's really sad about all of the things that we're talking about, the sense of disempowerment, its birth being having traumatic elements to it, and not just in the natural sort of flow of you know, ebbs and flows of of pain sensations, but that there is a real experience of being victimized and being put upon is that women who are sexual survivors and other trauma survivors 
are now experiencing birth as like a re-traumatizing experience and a triggering mm-hmm. experience. And so mm-hmm. that just has like, you know, a level of unfortunately like leverage to the level of trauma that they have that, that's really mm-hmm. unfortunate. But what's interesting too, I think, is that even women who don't have a sexual assault history or who aren't survivors of formal past trauma, they also are now experiencing birth as having really traumatic elements and feeling victimized. And some people have described it as, I felt like I was being raped. And, yeah. and so, you know, what I'll say about that is really, you know, the sense of disempowerment is, you know, really the connection between, you know, sexual assault and other kinds of aggressive traumas. And that, that sense of, you did this to me and I don't have the power to either say it I said something and you didn't do anything and I don't have the power to do something more about that. And so then you could see a lot of parallels, unfortunately, with maternal health, especially, you know, in the report of black women is that they felt that they had the right, even though they didn't like it, that the doctors could do what they were doing or could convince them to do things or could just make interventions and, you know, tell them your baby's going to die. Do you want your baby to die? If you don't, you need to do what I'm telling you. And just really use like this fear-based coercion to get them to submit to something that they really didn't want. And then later on, like all of this regret and I mean, just watching Mm -hmm. it and hearing it, it sounds just like if somebody had gone somewhere and then they were raped and then they're afterward, they're thinking, maybe I could have done something differently. Maybe I should have went to a different hospital. It's like, maybe I should have mm-hmm. not gone on my date. Maybe I shouldn't have let this guy take me out. Like, right. I mean, it's just really hard to listen and not make the connection between people experiencing birth is, you know, aggressively traumatic. And I think that that's something that the medical practitioners and sort of like our general normalized healthcare doesn't think of like fear-based coercion is getting someone, especially in a vulnerable position, mm-hmm. legs open, naked, exposed in, you know, an intense amount of body sensation, right. sort of out of it emotionally and focus wise, because contractions are bringing you back to focus and your, you know, so you yeah. don't even have all the wherewithal to make a decision, not just the decisions, but you don't have the wherewithal to fight with someone who's trying to get you to make decisions that they're not maybe telling you all the information about, Mm -hmm. or, you know, and just that the whole approach to it is just very traumatizing. And then if you add on top of that, people who've experienced trauma, who oftentimes, you know, like what we know in like mental health community is that they may be less likely to speak out against, you know, for themselves and against, Mm -hmm. you know, what they feel like is oppression because, They don't feel like they have the power. And so then you kind of couple that with a situation where a person would abuse that power to just, oh, I want to get home to my game. We can make this a quick birth. So we can do this Mm -hmm. augmentation and that augmentation. And, you know, people could be sitting there, the nurses or whoever, the doulas or, you know, think this is not necessarily necessary, but the way you're selling it is sounding like her baby's going to die. Or, you know, there's so many risks. You could get an infection. This could happen. That could Mm -hmm. happen. And so then the mom in fear wanting a healthy baby is going to go along with whatever it is. And then when things go awry, outcomes aren't what mom had hoped. And then later on, she realizes that, oh, he did something or she did something that they didn't have to do. It's just such a feeling of being taken advantage of and so many remnants of sexual assault that it's alarming. Yeah. So as you guys have been talking through all of this, I'm just thinking of the ramifications, the implications, what all of this means for not only in those, I don't know, several hours, couple of days, but after that, I mean, this is not just like a thing that happens and then you just go on your merry way. This is deeply impactful and potentially Mm -hmm. scarring for a long time. It makes me wonder about the level of stress that, you know, potentially they're already carrying from just dealing with this type of medical system, racism, issues with whatever, what they're dealing with with society in general, and then just having this load, this other load being put on them. What is that doing to their health, their mental health? So, you know, know, mm mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, I'm a survivor myself, and I'm also a person who's given birth in a hospital, right? So as we talk about this, I just always think about how important it is for us to speak from a sort of survivor-centered space that really looks at how we are not just victims based on experiences that may have victimized us in the past, whether that's as a child or as an adult, and that we do have the possibility of changing the narrative and changing our experience. So I just sort of really want to insert that, that, you know, even as we talk Mm -hmm. about some of the more traumatic experiences that women have had and the ways in which that's layered on top of past trauma and can be just another layer of post-traumatic stress, there's something that we can take out of this 
those of us who are survivors, which is that we can do it differently. You know, and mm-hmm. so, you know, one of the most common things that we heard about a lot was, you know, OBGYNs, nurses coming in and saying, well, you know, I've do, just basically going ahead and doing a vaginal exam, either just saying something very quickly or just not saying anything at all and just going straight for it. And so, you know, we had women talking about, well, this is one of the women actually a quote. She says, why are you touching me? What's your name? Could you introduce yourself before you start feeling me up? Can you tell me what you're doing? You know, so that sense that somebody literally is going to come and touch your vagina without even you knowing what their name is, right? Mm-hmm. But if we are knowledgeable about this and we've, you know, engaged with the report and we've had conversations with our birth supporters as we go in, we can know that we're not going to accept that. And we're actually going to say in advance, before anybody touches me, I want them to introduce themselves and ask mm-hmm. permission. And just by being in this hospital room doesn't mean I've given permission to everything that they want to do at event. Each touching has to then be another event of asking permission. And that was something that I had an experience of that I was actually able in my birth experience to tell everybody who was in my circle that I am a survivor and that this could be triggering for me and that being touched could create a sort of hypervigilant stress reaction for me. And that if I wasn't expecting it and that that could slow down and, you know, and so you can talk more about this, but this can actually slow down the natural physiological process of birth because you're not mm-hmm. supposed to be in a state of physical hypervigilance. You're supposed to be in a right. state of flow and relaxation, you know? And so, you know, I was able to tell my whole team that it's before anybody touched me, they had to say, I'm going to touch your, can I touch your, and I definitely didn't want anyone whose name I didn't know touching me, <laughs> right. period. No one could walk in the room and just go and examine me. And, and people were able to keep to that, you know, and even at the point when things got a little bit difficult and my baby's heart rate dropped, which of course is that crisis moment, which everybody is really, you know, very aware and worried about. And so that would tend to be the moment when all the rules would go out the window, right? All the ground rules would be established. So my midwife in that moment, she wasn't able to keep saying, I'm going to touch this, I'm going to touch that, because she just had to really be in, in the moment. But then my team was able to say, she needs uh-huh. to touch your thigh now, she needs, uh-huh. right? And so they continued that. And I came away from that experience actually feeling an enormous amount of healing around my trauma, because That's for me, great. things were different that time around. I was able to say no and to say, this is what I need and to set boundaries. So I think that's the other piece is that it can be something that we go through that can be re-traumatizing. It can also be something we go through that we actually can find our power in that. And that the more we collectively as a community talk about this and really talk about, you know, issues that a lot of black women a lot of times don't talk about in terms of being survivors, the more likely we are to have, you know, a positive experience. That's incredibly powerful. I'm so glad you had that reparative experience. And this amazing advice, too, that you're describing. I mean, most people don't think to say, you know, like you said, you go into this hospital room and it seems like people are just going to do what they need to do. But to give empowering advice and information like this that, hey, I need to know your name and you got to ask permission is for some people has never crossed their mind or may potentially they haven't felt like they were allowed to do that even. Right. I mean, it's kind of amazing that there's no other place in life where some stranger could come up to you and put their fingers in your vagina. Oh, my gosh. Right? Yeah, this is yeah. not something. <laughs> no. <but> somehow <laughs> we go in the hospital room and we put down all our expectations of how right, we should right. be treated. And it's like, it's a space, it's a human rights free zone. Right. And that's oh. not true. We right. actually do get to say that. So. Right. Right. So, yeah, you you know, know, it's also interesting, that? too. No, because it's also, there's no other place for a woman would experience so much direct trauma like or her power being taken away someone you know there was a case where the doctor without prompting or giving any you know forewarning you know reached in to start pulling out the placenta of a woman that had just had her baby and she's screaming and saying no I'm hurting can we wait can you pause and you know things like that happen not just oh that's a random thing that happened once in the course of medical care like Mm -hmm. that type of you know, going in, doing episiotomies without permission, doing, you know, this is also the space where it's the only time where that would happen. And then you'd walk away and be like, everything worked out okay. And so they never mention it and never report it. And never that person has to face, you know, any accountability for having, you know, taken such action. So, you know, this also the comparison between the Me Too movement. It's so interesting because what's similar is that, you know, in that movement, women, initially didn't feel empowered to say anything. And then at some point, somebody said something and then somebody else said, oh my gosh, that happened to me. Wait, that happened to me too. He did that to you. This, And then now you get this 
flux of, of women telling their stories. And it's a very similar thing to what's happening right now, I think, with birth, is mm-hmm. that women are sitting together and saying, this happened to me, and yeah. then hearing it and hearing somebody else say it, if you feel how traumatic it was, and then you think, oh my goodness, well, this also happened to me. And so now mm-hmm. there's all these stories being shared you know, about women's experiences in this way, very much, you know, like the Me Too movement, which is very interesting that there's that comparison. Yeah. In terms of how this is affecting women's mental health. Well, you know, psychologically, when you experience something that registers as traumatic to the body and to the mind, but you don't have whatever the capacity, the op- whatever it is to mitigate that and to handle it or to speak up, which does happen, but it be shut down. Then, you know, and I hear these stories of women sort of like having almost like a repetitive thought about what happened in the birth. So the way we would experience people who have trauma going back over the car accident and going back over the rape scenario, I'm like, well, what could have been done? And what did I do? And, and, you know, I'll hear women sort of recounting the traumatic story and trying to sort of work it out, but then Mm -hmm. all by themselves with nobody else to sort of triage it. And if they're fortunate enough to have had a doula who then can say, yeah, and this is what happened because you're also not completely focused on everything. And so maybe there's some elements that you don't remember, which is very similar in that kind of way to, you know, sort of like the standard trauma. So I think just that experience of trying to rectify what happened in a birth over with no resource and no ability to do something, which is, I think, what the circles and what, you know, battling over birth and these types of efforts have done Mm -hmm. in our community is there is something you can do. There is a conversation we can have. There is ways to make sure this doesn't happen again to other women or other women know that they, that this is wrong because a lot of women just think that this is normal. And so I think, you know, the reoccurring thoughts about the birth emotionally, obviously then if you experience something, it's really traumatic and overwhelming and unresolved, you're also now trying to breastfeed a baby. You know, your body mm-hmm. is stress, you know, the hormones and the changes and the chemicals in the body don't match up with the ones that you need to produce milk, right? Like, so right. in order to be calm, to produce milk, you have to have, you know, a sense of calmness, a sense of safety. The body in hypervigilance is not going mm-hmm. to really process what it needs to recover from birth and to produce milk if you are stressed and anxious and feel guarded and feel uncomfortable. And now you just really want to get out of the hospital or you really just mm-hmm. want to, you know, now you just, you know, and so the impact of that, I think is something that, you know, I wish, you know, we could even like all these studies in the world that I'd love to be done, but that's something so specific that I think um, to look at. Okay. And then just, you know, the fear-based coercion in the course of the labor in and of itself then is going to impact the way the labor progresses. And so if a woman is feeling scared, and she's not, you know, given reassurances and reminded to breathe. And the intention is for her to feel calm and safe throughout the labor. Rather, if the intention is to just have her do something in particular that you feel she needs to do. And sometimes things are necessary, but there's a way to communicate it where you solicit feelings of calm and understanding and a sense of safety and a sense of trust, Mm -hmm. then the labor is going to have some challenges. You know, the body, when it thinks a lion is coming to chase the mom in labor is going to close up and to tighten up and make it so that the baby can sort of stay and stay inside until mom Mm -hmm. feels she's safe. And so if mom feels unsafe through the course of the labor because of a variety of factors, then the progression of the labor is going to be, you know, changed. And that has its own impact, especially if you're in a hospital system that has timelines and, mm-hmm. oh, after 12 hours, they need to do this. And, mm-hmm. well, mom hasn't progressed in five hours, so that means this. And it's not taking into consideration the impact of the psychological and the stress level in the environment that's being created by the medical system that's saying mom needs to hurry up and progress. So it's like, right. give her Pitocin or give her whatever it is, you know, where you would see birth where mom is in a different state of mind, that there can be a level of progression. And if there is some waxing and waning of the labor, because there's not this agenda that it has to look like a certain kind of way to standardize, which then puts a lot of pressure, then mom is able to work through her labor as she needs to under the care of people who know what is healthy and what is needed, you know, and so it's not Mm -hmm. to take away from that, but just to really create a condition where a birth could occur and is natural and as vibrant as possible. Yeah, I'm just sort of thinking too about how unsafe that makes everything for the mom and the baby, just having a high level of stress. And unsafe is kind of a mild way to put it on some level. Mm -hmm. Well, 
one of the things that was really eye-opening, I think, in doing this research was finding out how postpartum depression was really connected to the birth experience. Oftentimes, we tend to think about postpartum depression as just hormonal. And in fact, that just is often put in there as if it's sort of minimized, right? right it's right. almost just natural. It's going to be expected. You don't have to take what she's saying too seriously because it's just hormonal, right? Mm -hmm. But actually, what we found was that there was a combination of things that were related to birth trauma as well as race and class and the situation that people were living in, whether the housing situation wasn't adequate, relationship challenges and even violence in relationships that all were combined together to create these really toxic environments for women who were bringing home a new baby. And that, that was really one of the challenges was that for black women, that that's a sort of taboo, that you know black women are supposed to be strong. And we discussed what came up time and time and again was the strong black woman syndrome. The idea that it was a weak thing to say that, you know, I'm depressed or I need help or I can't cope. And that women felt they just had to pull themselves together and get on. But if they weren't able to do that, then they just had another layer of shame and self judgment that went on top of the depression that they're experiencing. And so, you know, I think that that was one of the things that we realized is that we needed to really speak out about the fact that black women do experience postpartum depression, that when you have this combination of racism and economic challenges and relationship issues and maybe birth trauma, you know, it's normal and natural for you to be going through a lot of difficult emotions and that it can actually push over to depression for some, but not all women. And that reaching out for help is just a strong thing to do and it's not weakness. And so that was something that was really powerful for us to get those stories and you know, we even had a woman who shared a really tragic story about how she just was talking a lot about how terrible she felt to family members, but everyone was like, well, I, I've got work. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't help. You're just going to have mm -hmm. to pull it together. And she got so desperate that one day she actually pulled the blanket over her baby mm -hmm. and the comfort, I mean, and just literally walked out the door when the baby was crying. She just couldn't cope. And she felt like she was in an altered state like she was a zombie or something, mm -hmm. that she wasn't present. You know, she was just take, had gone over some edge. And then something happened and she snapped out of it and she realized what she'd done and she ran back in and she rescued her baby who could have been smothered to death, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is really, really serious that, you yeah, know, when is. women are going through this multiple traumas that do to, be to do with racism and what we're living in today as well as what happened in the birth experience and what's happened in the past, that it can have really, really serious mental health impacts that could have a long lasting impact on the woman or the parent and the child. Maybe this is an obvious question, but what should we be doing differently here? What can healthcare providers and systems and people be doing differently? I mean, what I hear very clearly is we have to be very aware about how we're talking to people and how we're using the people who have positions of power, how they're using it. That's one takeaway for sure. What else would you suggest we start doing today differently? The first thing that we have to recommend is that people get the report and they read the recommendations. Yeah. We thought really hard about what we wanted people to do differently. And there was a lot. It wasn't like two or three things. And it really depends if you're the family members or community of a pregnant person or if you're an OBGYN. Those are different things that we want you to do. And so right. we actually created these recommendations that are directed at you know, birthing persons, community members, organizations at health practitioners and birth professionals. So we want people to really, you know, read the report, learn more and find out what the specific recommendations are. We could talk a little bit about some of them, but I just really wanted to emphasize that getting yeah. the work out really involves people spending a little bit of time, putting a bit of work in to find out what it is that we need to do differently. Absolutely. In the show notes for this episode and in any communication I have about this episode, I will include a link to that so people can have access to that as well. Yeah, we're definitely um, hoping that people could use it as a tool. For example, if they have class or, you know, like a doula training, or if you just have a group of doctors that meet on a regular basis and you want to purchase bulk copies and people can get a huge discount for getting, I think it's more than 20 copies. So it's really seen, you know, something that's a tool. We work with this women's health press to produce this in a really cheap way. It's $20 or $10 in the e-version so that it could be accessible. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, we talk about prenatal care based on cultural humanity and empowerment. So that's like a whole okay. section on prenatal care. We talk about accountability. Remember we talked about the community accountability boards for people to actually sit down, practitioners to sit down and listen yeah. to experiences. And we talk about autonomy around location of birth supporting where women want to give birth. And we talked about reducing rates of interventions. 
and culturally sensitive postpartum? Some of the recommendations would be in prenatal care to have a culturally and empowering environment and approach. And so one of the things I think is really, you know, an example that I give is that you walk into a prenatal clinic and, you know, as a black woman, all the pictures on the wall are white women, the breastfeeding pictures and the pamphlet are of white women. All, I mean, just sort of not an obvious, inclusive, intentional presence that the people that they're trying to serve, you know, represent a diverse population. And so then a woman goes in and could potentially feel like I'm not really wanted here. So, you know, just really creating an environment that is culturally empowering that the woman, the birthing people who are walking into the space feel that they are welcome, that the intention was to serve women and other people who look and have a lifestyle and are like them. And so not where it seems everything was set up for someone else, oftentimes just women. And then I'm just sort of coming in to that space, which right. then doesn't feel like it's inclusive. And right. so it's in some ways pretty obvious. I mean, it's interesting. There's a lot of intentionality, you know, in Hispanic communities and Latino communities to put things in the language, even if people there do speak English, just to make you know that you are included and that their intention is to be serving you as well. And mm-hmm. so just really important to make a place where the women are feeling comfortable. The other thing is to be connected to other communities of color, other Black women organizations, if you are serving Black women, because mm-hmm. the communities are pretty small. A lot of times people are going to know each other and also they're going to, you know, feel connected to someone who's given them a referral from an organization and a medical center and a prenatal clinic that serves women that they know, okay, this is an ally basically in the community. And so that's really important to make those connections in the community. Second to that, also having accountability within the community that the community can then say, hey, this is a hospital, this is a clinic that we are reviewing to see whether or not you're actually culturally competent, culturally Mm -hmm. sensitive, whether or not you create a hostile environment based on the perceptions of the people who've entered your space. Mm -hmm. Because then in the community, they're empowered to be able to make choices about who they want to go to because then they're aware that this is someone who has not, you know, passed the test. And the other thing is that it puts hospitals and clinics and birth centers on notice that it matters that they are received as respectful and as culturally sensitive to the community yeah. Otherwise, they're going to be, you know, called to question about that. That's awesome. So these are just a couple of the things that you guys have put together in your recommendations, and those are already so powerful. Yeah, I could talk a little bit about some of the recommendations that we have, a whole section on recommendations for black women and pregnant persons. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think that one of the powerful things about our report is we wrote it in a way that is not only accessible, but targeted towards black women themselves. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, stuff that's written about our maternal health is not written in language or put in a place where black women would get access to it. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make sure we had a whole section that was really what you can do, you know, so you don't have to feel that you're just going to be victimized by this big anonymous system because we don't believe that, you know, we think it is possible to have an empowered, powerful birth. So we talked about, first of all, empowering ourselves with knowledge and support making sure that people read the report, that they're knowledgeable about it and that they're bold in asking for support. So really, you know, pushing off this label of, uh, you know, strong black woman syndrome and instead mm-hmm. saying, no, I'm going to have my circle of supporters both before, during, and also after I give birth. And I'm going to actually be really clear and asking for what I need. And we talked about that, how important that is for survivors in particular, but for everybody, you know, right. to say, this is what I need you to do. Can you do this for me? And if you can't, maybe I need to find another practitioner. <laughs> so mm-hmm. that was important. We talked about really exploring options because there's so much variety even within one city or one town. If you go to one OBGYN versus another one who might have a different approach and attitude, or if you go to circle-based midwifery prenatal care versus, you know, the kind of 10-minute appointment with an OBGYN, you'll have a totally different experience. So a lot of times we just show up for whatever it seems to be right in front of us, but instead doing research and making a decision about what's going to best support us. And one of the things we found in the report was that sometimes women were just saying, oh, my experience of prenatal care was so hostile and so culturally inappropriate, I'm just not going to go. But that's not advisable either because sometimes there are reasons why we actually do need to get checked up. And Mm -hmm. particularly with things like high blood pressure and so on, it's important to get checked. So, But in a way that's really supportive. I always talk about my experience of prenatal care 
with a midwife. It was it felt like a cross between a fairy godmother, <laughs> a health checkup, and a therapy session. That's <laughs> so awesome. that's what prenatal care should feel like. Yeah, or something like that. Anyway, absolutely. I wish I had that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that sounds amazing. And then we also talked about really exploring the range of strategies to pay for a birth experience that honors right. you. Oftentimes yeah. we think that's a luxury we can't afford, you know, mm-hmm. paying for mm-hmm. birth. We say, look, if I'm going to have any money saved, it's going to go down for, you know, maybe I'm going to have so much of stuff I'm going to buy for the baby, or I'm going to put it down in some kind of fund for, you know, a preschool or something like that. But actually that first experience is so powerful and important for both the mom and our ability to parent and for the child. So not thinking mm-hmm. that it's not important. So for example, you know, I paid, I think, $1,000 for my pre, during, and after doula care. And that felt like a lot of money at a time when, you know, I felt like I needed to buy a lot of clothes and stuff for the baby. Mm-hmm. And actually what I did is I didn't buy any of that stuff. I got that from friends through my church. And it was so worth the money I spent on getting the support I needed. In fact, I do believe that if it wasn't for her doing these pressure points on my back when I was having back labor, I do believe I would have had a C-section because mm. the pain was intolerable except when she was doing the pressure points. Mm. And she had to keep them off for about 10 hours too. <laughs> <laughs> so just thinking about what's it worth spending money on? And maybe we don't go to any of those baby superstores. I'm not going to mention the names. Maybe mm-hmm. we just don't go, you know? And we ask people to donate instead towards having a powerful birth experience. And then we also talked about really thinking carefully about home birth center or hospital birth, that you don't have to just have a hospital birth just because maybe your family members think you're a hippie if you don't, you know, <laughs> but you can just really make some choices. And there's plenty of black women midwives out there and there's plenty of black women who are having home births and having birth center births. And so you really can have those options. And some of them will, some of those birth centers accept, you know, medi and, you know, it doesn't have to be an inexpensive thing. So, you know, there's more options than we often realize. And then really just really realizing that we can have, you know, an unmedicated vaginal birth if that's what we want, you know, and that's not for everybody, but it is something that we can have. And just because, you know, people say, oh, it's too much, you won't be able to cope or, oh, you've got fibroids, you know, it's going to be a difficult birth. Don't listen to that, you know, listen to your own self. And for me, you know, it was important for me to be present when my baby came out and for my baby to be present and not drugged and for us to connect and bond and for my baby to be able to just immediately find away to my breast and thus and that's something I wanted and I was able to have and so anybody who feels that that's something that they want should be able to have that and it's not something that we can be turned away from. That's incredibly empowering. Well one of the things that we really found is that there's so many negative messages in society but specifically in black communities about breastfeeding about what it'll do to your body you know about it's nasty to do it over a certain age or it's just nasty to do it You know, a lot of young black women, you know, they just get these messages that it's just not something that's nice to do. And I think a lot of it has to do with that intergenerational trauma of having to nurse white babies during slavery and just somehow feeling like a nasty thing. And Mm -hmm. it's just clearly not. And I use that word because that word came up so many times, particularly with younger women. And so we really want to, you know, spread the message that there were so many women who we interviewed, who had amazing experiences of breastfeeding and, you know, really kicked, you know, that stereotype that it's something that you can't do when they were breastfeeding in church and when mm-hmm. it's supposed to be a place you can't, you know, or they're breastfeeding, you know, in public transit or at their workplace and that they were just claiming space and really doing that as powerful warrior moms, you know. So mm-hmm. we also wanted to put across that message that we don't have to just go down the formula road just because that's something that maybe our families have done in the past generations, Mm -hmm. but we can actually start out with doing something new. Yeah. I want to add to that too, that it's very much like an opportunity to take your power back. I mean, had you have a beautiful experience and the opportunity that you wanted in your birthing, it's also just, you know, beautiful and nurturing and bonding, but should you have not had the best experience and one that you may have felt that you would have liked to do differently then you get this whole opportunity to feed your baby from your body and create bonds. And, you know, one of the things that I see with women that breastfeed is that it really mitigates a lot of the, you know, even just the normal baby blues and just the natural ebb and flow of, you know, the busyness and tiredness after having a baby, because it keeps the attachment going. It keeps the bonding going. It makes you think about your self care because you have to drink if you want milk and you need to eat if you want milk. And so it helps naturally support and sort of force you to take care of yourself Mm -hmm. and to be, you know, connected in time because, you know, you can't, 
get too far about because every two hours there's all that baby. And so then you need to sit down and you need to be mindful and you need to remember. And so I think breastfeeding is such for all women is such a wonderful opportunity to sort of mitigate any just glitches, you know, in the process, because now you really get to have this reparative experience where you in your full control, nobody can nurse your baby for you. Nobody can help Mm -hmm. you care for yourself. I mean, they might be able to give you an apple and make you some shakes, but really you're in full dominion of that relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's very empowering and it's very reinforcing, you know, of your role as parent and as provider and as nourisher. I mean, it's one of those things to me, I think is very revolutionary in the black community, because when you see a black mom breastfeed, I mean, this new generation is changing the paradigm where you never would see that, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Now, it's almost like if you're not doing that, people are like, oh, why aren't you breastfeeding? And it's Mm -hmm. such a powerful revolution, I think, that's happening in the black community where a lot of people think black women don't breastfeed. And, you know, my response now is like, I don't know what community you're in. Like, I'm traveling the country and I'm seeing black women breastfeeding Mm -hmm. everywhere and really taking that role back. And um, just it's very empowering. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you, Professor Opara, and thank you, Dr. Saida, for your wealth of information. And I know we've only just really scratched the surface here of the depth and meaning of the work that you've been doing and what you see out in the community and the work that you're doing for Black women. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the opportunity. There is so much information here to absorb and learn more about. As usual, this is just a launching point of information. So to deepen your understanding, please find out more by reading the Battling Over Birth Report that can be found on blackwomenbirthingjustice.org slash battlingoverbirth. I would also love for you to learn more about our guests today, and I will have links to their websites in the show notes. Please connect with Black Women Birthing Justice on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And as usual, come connect with us over at our Mom and Mind Connection Facebook page on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Until next time. Thank you for joining us today. Please share this podcast. Together, we can support moms and families so that no one has to deal with this alone. Come connect with us on Facebook and Instagram at Mom and Mind. Mind.